Welcome to College Physics Second Edition, Chapter One, The Introduction. We'll be talking about the nature of science and physics. One basic question that students have is why, even though they're not physics majors, why are they taking physics class? And the answer is that physics governs how everything behaves. If you have a very good understanding of fundamental physics concepts, then all the observations you make will make perfect sense. One obvious example is your phone. If you understood the electronic components, understood the communication mechanisms with electromagnetic radiation, it would make sense on how the GPS function is working. That's just one example. Another example is medicine. If uh, this is an example of a uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, if you understood how water behaves, be all the hydrogen in your atoms can be forced to emit a particular radiation, we can get images like this. But again, Understanding what the fundamentals are helps explain why we can see why what we can see in these images or how things work. Explaining the behavior of a plant cell. It takes physics, chemistry, and bio to explain what the properties are, what the behaviors are, and why they're doing it. And again, more cell structures. If you understand what is needed, then Physics and chemistry explains how it happens. We have some notable physicists, for example, Isaac Newton. Everybody hears his name. He is responsible for Newton's laws, which are the fundamental approaches to how we deal with forces. He is also a man who also developed calculus. Another is uh, Madame Curie. She dealt with radiation and ended up dying of a cancer, but because of all of her research in uh, atomic and nuclear physics, she ended up getting a Nobel Prize in both physics and chemistry. Physics students will learn how to model situations. An example here was modeling the atom. The nucleus created uh, protons and neutrons are sitting in the center, and here the electrons sit in planetary orbits about the nucleus. Again, this is a model that helps us understand and analyze the situation. All physics students will learn how to model a situation. Before experimental physics, there were natural philosophers. These people are ones that sat around, made observations, thought about the observations, and tried to find common cause and effects. An example would be this was um, Aristotle, who made observations, but he never did an experiment, which really sets them apart from what we define as current scientists. Galileo is an example of someone who moved away from natural philosophy and into experimentation. What he did was he made the observations similarly to the natural philosophers, thought about it, came up with a reason why he was observing what he observed, but then he set up an experiment to test whether he was right. And this is the beginning of modern science. Another notable scientist is Niels Bohr. He made a lot of contributions to quantum mechanics, modern physics. He did a tremendous amount of work that helped us understand the atom, its energy levels, how the electrons can move about, and why they're doing it. One of the first experiments leading to the development of the model of the atom 
was the Gull's Rutherford experiment, where they shot uh, alpha particles through a gold film. Now we have a bit better technology, and we can actually see the individual atoms composed in a thin sheet using instrumentations like a scanning telenoling microscope. Units are fundamental to any science. If we do not have units, we do not have any idea what anyone else is saying. There is a lack of communication and understanding, so units are of the utmost value. For example, if I told you the cable is 20, you're going to ask me 20 what? And if I say 20 miles, that means one thing, 20 inches means something else. So units are of the utmost value. And the units we use for physics will be meters, that's our distance, kilogram, that will be for mass. And seconds is used for time. These are our three fundamental units for physics. All of the other units we will get are based on these three fundamentals. So our distance will be in meters, mass is in kilograms, and time will be in seconds. For example, what's a meter? Today's definition of a meter is based on the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, so here is officially the distance light travels in a vacuum in that many seconds. That's the formal definition. The way we can define time, today we use atomic clocks such as, and specifically, the cesium atom. When distances get incredibly large, we tend to move away from the metric system and slide into units that make a little more sense, such as light years. Light year is defined as the distance light travels in one year in a vacuum. Fun basically the distance light travels in space in one year. This is an incredibly large amount of distance, which we now have a new unit. So again, the units we use in general largely depend on the scale of the system we're talking about. The laws of physics can describe any phenomenon, including phenomenon such as supernova remnants like the Veil Nebula. When we understand why it occurs, we understand why it glows. And today, we know the scale and the behavior what's happening in this nebula. And we're talking about light years in scale that sits across. We also understand that the supernova itself is a massive event, high energy event, that allows for the creation of all elements on the periodic table. One of the other units we will use is, and mass, is kilograms. Now, massing and weighing are related, but are fundamentally different. Mass in kilograms describes how much matter something is made of. Weight describes how much force the Earth is pulling down on said mass. So weighism, weighing, or weight is force. Mass is how much material is sitting there. And what we typically do is we have a known against an unknown, which is how we determine either mass or weight. And again, our unit for mass will be kilograms. Today, we typically use an electronic device to do the massing, such as uh, your digital scale. Um, a simple example of this would be your food scale. 
Now we are going to dis discuss accuracy and precision. The best way to describe accuracy and precision is to use a bullseye. The center of the bullseye represents the correct answer. The bullets are the experimental values. So accuracy represents when you can keep getting the correct answer. That is accuracy. Precision is a bit different. Accuracy and precision tend to be used as synonyms, but inside the classroom they mean something else. Accuracy is getting to the right answer. Precision represents the ability to keep reproducing an answer. So in this bullseye, the precision is high, but the accuracy, accuracy is low. Estimating is a very useful tool. If you estimate, you can get a ballpark answer and know what you're looking at or looking for. For example, this stack is $100 bills, which means it is worth $10,000. So how many stacks make up a trillion dollars? This is just using powers of 10 to answer. So to get this, we know we have $10,000 and we want to make up a trillion dollars. Trillion is 10 to the, let's see, trillion, let's see. Millions to the six, billions to the ninth, trillions to the twelfth. Okay. In order to do this, this is a power of ten exercise. We know we have ten thousand dollars, and we know we have a. We want to know how many makes a stack. So this is really we use dimensional analysis for this. So we have stack. Just ten thousand dollars per stack. So that's one ratio we have, and we're interested in how many stacks will make up a trillion dollars. So this is the ratio we're going to use. So let's start with what we have. We have a trillion dollars, which is ten to the twelfth dollars. So. To get rid of this, we need dollars on the bottom and stacks on the top. So we're going to use dimensional analysis to solve this. And then our ratio is the $10,000 to stacks. So this was our ratio, and this is us how we use the ratio. And then when we get our answer, let's just move this down so we have this. I tend to the one, two, three, four, fourth. That's how many stacks we have, right? Because dollars divides away, leaving us with stacks. And 10 to the 12th divided by 10 to the 4th is 10 to the 8th stacks. That is how many stacks of money we would have for a trillion dollars. In this example, we're going to take into account sig figs or significant figures. So let's add first. So let's do, I prefer this way to write the one with more sig figs on top and the least sig figs on the bottom. It doesn't really matter, but I prefer that. Let's go ahead and add them as you would anyway. So we get 6, 9.5. Now this is if you just use straight addition. The problem is, this is an accurate answer, meaning we have to take into account sig figs. And because of the way sig figs work, the least sig fig is here, which means this, path, this third digit is gone, which means the actual answer will be rounded up to 6.0. 
that is the actual answer to this problem. All right, now let's do the example where we multiply because the sig fig rules are different with multiplication and division. So let's do the 5.251 times basically 3.0, which is same as 3. Okay, which gets us 3, 15, carry the 1, that becomes a 7, that becomes a 15. We have 3 sig fig, so it becomes 15.735. Now that is the answer when you multiply. Now when we take into account sig figs, we have to do this. This one has four sig figs. This one has two sig figs, which means that's how many sig figs the final answer must have, which means our answer is actually only 16.